Oops. There we go. So welcome to our monthly leadership call, which is really, I think, um, designed to just give you some enrichment and give you some food for thought and some leadership lessons in general that will help you in your business, help you in your uh, role as an ALC member and or staff member, uh, help you in your um, relationships, because at the end of the day, there's always someone that we're leading. Am I right? We're always showing up as leaders. And so this month, um, what I want to talk to you about and focus on is um, some, some lessons that are coming from Benet Brown's book called Daring Greatly. Has anyone read this book? Uh, not Daring Greatly, I'm sorry, Dare to Lead. <laughs> not, uh, that's Daring Greatly is another book that she wrote, but this is about Dare to Lead. Has anyone read that? This is new to all of you? All right, so I'm gonna tell you, um, I'm gonna encourage you to make a mental note and uh, add this to your reading list because it's an amazing book. And so some of the concepts we're gonna talk about, I'm just gonna shut my window. Some of the concepts we're gonna talk about today may be uh, a little innovative in the conversations around leadership that we've had before. So Daring Greatly, um, her book, Daring Greatly and her book, Dare to Lead, both look at how to embrace vulnerability. So if you're taking notes, write down that word vulnerability. And the book discusses really how embracing vulnerability and acknowledging our own imperfection is necessary in order for us to be great leaders. And it's necessary for us to really grow as people. And so I think when we take a look at this today, um, it's about acknowledging that vulnerability in itself opens us up to having really honest conversations. So I'm gonna open this up to you guys right now if you wanna come off mute. So when you hear vulnerability and how vulnerability can help you become a great leader or better leader, um, any, any thoughts around that so far? Who gets excited to talk about how they're vulnerable? <laughs> no one. No one, right? Why? <laughs> um, because it exposes, you know, like your uh, your weaknesses, basically. It might, yeah, it might for but sure. But you know what they are. You know, you have to be uh, true to yourself. Yeah, right. Because if you, if the first step to growth is awareness, right? If you're not aware of something, you can't fix it, right? Yeah. So here's a question I want to ask, and I'd like to hear from a few of you. Um, how can you become a more effective leader? If you set out on that mission today to become a more effective leader, what are some ways that you can, can do that? Hmm. Maybe communicate better. Okay, to improve your communication. I like that. What else? Always be, be a better listener. Okay, so to that, yeah, that falls into communication, listening, more active listening, for sure. What else? Trust. <clears throat> Say it again, Lisa. Sorry, Aaron. Trust. Trust in others. Maybe. Developing trust in others. Very good. And what about, what about your ability to trust them? Both, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a big part of vulnerability and we were gonna talk about trust okay. today. That was really good. What else? Just thinking bigger oh, yeah. than you were thinking before. More. Thinking bigger, good. Oh, Allison? Oh. I'm sorry, did I unmute? Yes, I did have something to say. Um, sorry if I was interrupting. Um, being authentic. Yes and be, like being more in, as authentic as you possibly can. Some, for some people it comes natural and for others, um, sometimes it is exposing vulnerabilities. And I think when people do that, when they expose themselves that way, they feel like they might be losing control or strength, but really in reality, you're gaining trust and you're allowing people to see who you are and therefore it's building a relationship. That's my opinion. Well said, I love it. You all have really great things to say. Rebecca, the question was, how can I become a more effective leader? 
That was the question. I think execute what you're go what you say you're going to do. So act on what you say you're going to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Walk the walk. Don't just okay. talk the walk. Okay. Good. What else? Anything else? Show up in ways that others don't, even when it's uncomfortable for you to do. And, and I guess that's like showing your vulnerability, um, which is giving them permission to show theirs, right? Mm-hmm. So everything that you guys said is so spot on. Um, we're going to talk about. Yeah, go ahead, Vicki. Go ahead. I was going to say to make it about them and not about you. Um, okay. Yes. And I was going to say something also, um, because I'm the queen of enablement. Um, get them to do things for themselves and not you doing it for them. That will, you know, lead them down a better path in the end. Mm-hmm. Love that. So everything that you're saying is true. And here's what Benet Brown sums it up as in the book. It is courage. <clears throat> to be a more effective leader, you have to be willing to be more courageous. So I want that to sink in for a minute because the most effective leaders show courage. Courage to admit when they're wrong, courage to take feedback, Courage to step out in ways other people aren't willing to do. Courage to be vulnerable. Courage in um, showing how they think and feel. And also courage in how to manage how they think and feel, right? And a lot of the things that you talked about here all relate back to courage. So we're going to talk a little bit about how your values, your emotions, and the way that you interact with people all define your leadership style. So let's break it down a little bit. So let's talk a little bit more about vulnerability because in order to be courageous, we have to be comfortable being vulnerable. Would you agree? Somebody say yes? Okay. So what makes you feel vulnerable? Who wants to share that? <laughs> Doing videos. Doing Make videos? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I get it. What else? Not knowing the answer or, you know, having to go to someone else for it, I guess. So I want to talk about that for a second and connect that. I love what you just shared, Stephen. So it's, it's a vulnerable feeling when you feel like you don't know the answer. Is that true for a lot of us? Yet if we're gonna be effective leaders, we need the courage to say, I don't know the answer to that. Because I heard, I think it was Allison say that what makes you an effective leader is being authentic. People want leaders who are real more than they want a leader who is right. So as the ALC, as the staff here, right? Where we're, people come to us, we're resources. But, you know, is it possible you just don't know everything? Yeah, I think it's possible. Um, you know, everyone meet Heather. Hi, Heather, say hello. Hi, everyone. Heather's the new team leader here at Hudson Valley United, and she's on day four. <laughs> and we were just talking about, you know, how many resources and how much education is here and you know, how there's a lot to learn, right? And so whether you're on yeah. day four or day 444 or 4,044, is it possible that you might not know everything? So it's vulnerable to say, I don't know the answer, but it's courageous to admit it. And, and, and I think the courage then comes in to saying, I'm gonna find that answer for you. I'm gonna connect you. So it's not just saying, I don't know, <laughs> go figure it out. It's saying, that's a great question. I don't have the answer to that. Let's figure it out together. Or I'm going to call someone who I think might have that information and we're going to get, get that to you. Right. So I think that's important. Um, what else makes you feel vulnerable as a leader? Beth? The unknown. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it's similar. That's why I got back off on mute. Like if, if just stepping out, if you haven't been in a leadership for, uh, position. I mean, I think that we are, we're all, I mean, I've been a leader my whole life just by being a mother and a wife and those things. But when you're put into a leadership position um, and that's your 
title now, it's it can be a little, uh, it can it can feel vulnerable. I get, it makes me feel vulnerable. Yeah. And being a leader is a big responsibility. Would you agree? It's a big responsibility that we take on, right? So anybody else want to share something that they can say makes them feel vulnerable as a leader? Liz? Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to share. Oh. I know, I know I get a little bit vulnerable when I make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. And what, what about that makes you feel vulnerable? Well, I think that, I mean, you've met me before, not everybody has, but I, I set myself to very high standards. Um, so when I misstep, um, it does put me in a very, like in a mentally vulnerable position, but at the same time, it's a stepping stone and a learning opportunity, For sure. but you, I still get that vulnerability from it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Heather. Liz, you wanted to share something? Hello, everyone. Sorry, I was like, I had uh, an aging in my mouth. Um, not hitting goals, not meeting expectations makes me feel very vulnerable because part of what makes a leader is making a commitment and taking it seriously. So when you fall short of that mark, it can be very, very scary. Hence the reason. Can anyone I relate to what Liz is saying? Who's ever been in that place before? Oh, wait, yesterday we broke down on our Zoom meeting. That was me. <laughs> we've all been there, right? We've all been there. All been there. Thank you, Liz. So here's the thing that's interesting about this. We we if I really asked everyone to share something they you all could you all not come up with something that has made you feel vulnerable right a hundred percent so it's a common feeling yet no one wants to ever talk about it why and what i love about Brene brown is she throws vulnerability right at you and she says listen until you you understand that this is normal and embrace the lessons it's teaching you, you can never excel at anything that you're doing. You can't become that dynamic, effective leader. And you know what the problem is? Because when we think about vulnerability, we attach negative stigma to it. What do we attach to vulnerability, Lisa? You're looking at me, I see you. My, like, like I... my emotions go wild. Um, I tend to cry. I'm a cry, I'm sorry. But uh, it's not that I'm crying, tears start you know, my emotions start to run wild. So, so for instance, I can't meet my goals. I get stressed out and I get emotional. That's how I am. I'm sure a yeah. lot can relate. So. Because what, so how many of you can relate to that? That vulnerability can get you right here and make you feel like very emotional, feel like you're going to cry, get upset, throw up. You know, we feel exposed, right? And I think the other part of vulnerability is that we associate it with weakness. Yeah. And if you take anything away from our conversation today, I want, and what I really work hard to do as a coach is help people embrace their vulnerability, get comfortable with it. Cause in that vulnerable space is opportunity in the vulnerable spaces is opportunity. And what Lisa said about trust is a big thing too, right? You have to know, and I get this, that if you're going to have that vulnerable moment that the people around you trust you and that you trust them. Because we worry, we, we don't want to show our vulnerability because we think people will think less of us, that we think that they'll think we're weak or that we're not capable or that we're not smart. And, you know, we all go through as a leader, you know, I, I take leadership very seriously. I've been a leader since I was a little kid, five years old, going to the playground and being there for four minutes. I had nine kids coming home for lunch. They all wanted to follow me home, right? And I make a joke out of that. But the truth of the matter is I've had those moments too. The ALC at Hudson Valley United had a come to Jesus meeting with me a few months ago to tell me all the things that weren't working. And I took it very personally. I had a very vulnerable moment. I took it on as I'm failing. And these women think I'm weak or they think I don't care or they think I'm not capable or they think I'm not smart enough. That was the story in my head. I don't know, maybe it was the story in their head, but I think it was the story in my head. And I think we just get to a point where we're afraid to let that vulnerability show. 
But yet in the vulnerability becomes the opportunity, right? Because that was a call to action. That was an opportunity for me to take feedback in a group of people that I trusted, that I felt trusted me, and I was able to listen to that. And it wasn't always easy, but I was able to hear it and we were able to act on it. And in a short time, we, we've made some great changes. I hope that ALC agrees we've made some good changes, right? And we're still moving forward. So we agree. Who's, so who's been in that space? Okay, <laughs> good. Who's been in that space before <laughs> where you got feedback, right? And you take it so personally and you think it's because you're a failure and that's not what it's about. So that's an important part of this conversation too, because we have to know as the leaders of this company that we've got each other's back, that we are able to have a, a balance of care and candor and, and there's a way to provide feedback, right? And then there's a, no, there's a way not to provide feedback, but that feedback is part of the communication. I heard a lot of you talk about communication as being an effective leader. If you're not in a place where you can effectively provide feedback, are you really in an opportunity to make anything better? So tell me your thoughts so far, what's going on in your head right now? Who wants to share just some random thoughts that are popping in based on this conversation up till now? Any? Am I speaking to anybody? I will. I okay. will. So for me, like I said, my emotions run wild. Her trust, it is really hard for me to trust others. Um, always been in, always being in the financial um, side of things. I've caught people stealing money. I've, you know, I, and I, I, and I'm talking big money. I'm not talking $5 here and there. I'm talking thousands of dollars and being, being my leader, them being my leader, you know, um, I've been put in situations that were very um, hard to deal with. And it's, it is hard for me, but I've been learning um, how to deal with that and cope, but it's not easy for me. Uh, most people do trust me. I, I guess I give off that vibe um, when I meet them, but um, it's hard for me to trust others. Thank you for sharing that. I know that's vulnerable to share that. Thank you. We're going to talk a little bit more about trust. Anyone else have any thoughts that are kind of just hanging on right now? Aaron, did you want to say something? Oh, I wasn't sure if you were unmuting. I'll, you know, I'll say something. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. No, I think it just comes down to some, it's actually something you said a couple of weeks ago in a mojo that you are on where it's not win or lose, it's win or learn. So we could be vulnerable with losing and it's what we learn out of it. But I know me personally, I'm very vulnerable to accountability when I don't meet a goal or I don't succeed in something and it's a learning experience if you look at it that way yeah thank you for sharing that too you know what i think happens to most of us i don't know if it happens to all of us but most of us when we're accountable to someone and we're not on track to the goal um we can tell ourselves that it's about that other person or it's about the goal but it's really not it's about us feeling we let ourselves down right because we know what we're capable of and, and honestly, I think we're capable beyond what we can comprehend, but we, we probably are more disappointed in ourselves, right? And it's, it's that feeling that has us, you know, uncomfortable with accountability sometimes, right? Would you agree with that? Stephen, what were you going to say? I was going to say that being a leader is already hard enough and then developing leaders is a whole nother thing. And that, you know, especially in real estate, you have to balance a lot of different personalities and it, it can be difficult. And, and uh, I guess the biggest thing that I've noticed so far, and I've only been here three weeks, is just it's the mindset. It's just not getting bogged down, staying positive. And as a leader, that's definitely the hardest part. As Liz said, when you don't meet goals, when you fail, when you don't reach what you're trying to reach, it's really hard. And as a leader, that impacts your entire team and your the energy at work. So just keeping your energy up and making sure you can you don't have, you know, you're human. You can't be strong every second of the day. But as a leader, you're typically, you have to have that mental of responsibility, which is hard. Yeah, very insightful. You know, and that's true. I think we've talked about that before. Leaders grow other leaders, right? That's the sign of an effective leader. It's not managing people. It's helping other people grow into their own leadership, right? And with that, it's a lot of responsibility. And it's, it's, 
you know, it is about mindset. And, you know, that's why we've designed these calls for you once a month, really. It's not to talk about the market center's business, not to run numbers, not to ask you about what the numbers in your, it's, it's really to pour into you these thought provoking questions that sometimes we don't give ourselves enough time to ask. And we certainly don't give ourselves enough time to answer. That's the mission in, in these group calls once a month it is to give you some, some things that will help you grow as a person. And the other thing that, um, you know, Brene Brown talks about in Dare to Lead, which I, I do encourage you to add to your um, growth plan, is that vulnerability is not just part of being courageous or essential to courage. Vulnerability is essential to creativity and growth. So if you think about that, right, in order to have the ability to, to grow the market center, grow your business, to be creative enough to try new things, to dare greatly, right, you have to be willing to, to be in that vulnerable space because when you're trying something new, are you sure, like really sure it's all going to work out 100%? Not really, like even with the best laid out plan, you still have to go through the actions to get there, right? So so in order to, you know, like for, I'm gonna to talk to the team leaders right now, right? Their growth is your thing and you're moving the market center forward and we're looking to break through right now our current level of production to another whole level. You have to have a, a, a I think, a, be comfortable with being vulnerable, right? Because this is uncharted territory and you have to be creative. So for our ALC members and our agents on the call, you know, the market, the market right now is, uh, it's trying your patience. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> right. It, there's a Absolutely. lot, right. There's a lot to deal with. You're in some new situations you haven't dealt with before. It's shifting and changing what you thought you knew about working with clients is suddenly different, right? So you have to be okay getting uncomfortable and being vulnerable there too. So anytime we're looking to excel and looking to grow, I think being a courageous leader, being comfortable with vulnerability is, is part of that growth. Now, the other thing that um, I, I wanna talk about, which we've touched on a little bit is this concept of feedback and accountability. So who are you accountable right now in your business? Write down the name of the person or people that you're accountable when it comes to your business goals. Who is accountable to more than one person? I think Do, we all are. Yeah. yeah. So I'm curious to know, does your list include your family as well. How many of you put family members down? So I want to talk to that group. Why did you put family members down as being accountable to them? Delise, I'm going to pick on you. Because they're always watching. Tell me more about that. Who's watching you? My kids, my husband, definitely my husband. <laughs> Is it, is it when you say you're, it's so uh, we'll leave Mike out of the picture for a minute with your kids. Is it because you're a role model to them, right? So you feel a, a, not just a responsibility, but accountability to them. Yes, definitely. To be a better version of myself every day. So yeah. I have them looking, even though it doesn't seem like they are sometimes to me, but I just imagine that there are, that they are watching too. Yeah. 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 So um, how many people put down family members as, as part of who they're accountable to? Okay, good. And then who, who has also in their group of accountability, someone who is either a direct, like for those of us on the leadership team, we have someone we report to, right? Um, I know that you would, that would make sense. You would have that on there. Um, but what about my agents on the call? Who are you accountable to in, in other than your family? Who is holding you accountable to your goals? Who is holding you accountable to your actions towards your goals? Um, how many of you have a coach or someone that's helping you, your team leader on a regular basis? And who can say that that's something they need to really look at? Maybe it's missing. Anybody willing to be vulnerable and say, I think that's I'll, missing from my world? I'll say something, Anna. Tell me, hi, Lee. Hi, sorry, I'm in the car, but I wanted to be on the call. Um, Definitely 
accountable to not only a coach, but an admin and a team. Um, if you say you're going to do something or if you're helping them goal set, you really have to be on top of your own goals because we certainly lead through example. Um, and then of course, team goals or the goals that you're helping them set, you know, you're there for an accountability purpose for them. And, and they're also there for an account, accountability purpose for you as well. So like I have an admin who's always like, did you do what, what you said you were gonna do today? You know, and she keeps me on my toes. That's awesome. That's awesome. And does that, that gives you the, um, well, it makes you show up, right? In a different way. Yeah, it does, it does. I mean, I think even part of becoming an adult in our thirties, is sticking with the things that we say we're going to do. And like Delise was saying, especially for your children too. Like if I tell my kids, I'm going to take them somewhere on a Saturday, I better not schedule an appointment. Mm -hmm. So this is an area, thank you for sharing that Lee. This is an area that Brene gets into in the book, right? And, and a, a couple of you talked about, it. I think it was Steven with mindset that's why a part of this conversation, becoming a more effective leader, getting comfortable with vulnerability, daring to lead, because being a leader is, is an act of courage. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, you have to be daring enough to do it because how many people are willing to kind of slide into the background and let someone else take the lead, right? We have to understand and acknowledge that we are a small minority of the population. Most people do not want to be a leader but you're different. You're cut from a different cloth. So your values, your values anchor you, right? Your values are the rules you live by. And if any one of you has not had an experience of really sitting down and, and getting clear about what your values are, I have an exercise that I can send you. I would be happy to work with you a little bit one-on-one -on, -one on it. It's a big part of what I do as a coach is to help people identify their values. Because if you don't really know what your values are, and if, I, if I'm your coach and I don't know what your values are, then I run the risk of, of losing with you, right? Because your values are the rules you live by. That's like your GPS. So your core values come into play as a leader. And sometimes that can be one of the reasons why you might feel like you're not as effective as a leader as you should be, because either you don't know enough about your core values or you're not demonstrating your core values, right? And when you're not in alignment with your core values, life is friction. It's really funky. So if anyone wants some support on that, let me know. But by knowing your core values and being clear about what those are, it helps to keep your emotions in check and it helps to keep you moving forward in a way that, that makes sense for you, right? Because again, if, you're, if your core values are not supported, then you feel out of alignment, right? So how many of you feel like you need to do a little work on knowing what your values are? Okay, that's fine, we can work on that. Um, so our values tell us, right? They inform our judgment about what's important in our lives. That's why knowing your values are, are really key. So that if an opportunity shows up, you know, sometimes opportunities show up and they look great on the surface and it seems exciting, but when you really examine it, you can say, you know what, this doesn't really line up with my core value. And so I'm not gonna do it because if I try to do it, it's just gonna be friction for me. Why do you think this comes up in leadership? This concept of knowing your values uh, and, and, and how this ties back to courage and vulnerability. It can show what our strengths and weaknesses are. And if it is a weakness, it's something that we can work on. Definitely. Absolutely. What else? Uh, values, you know, it translates into every little moment of your life. So if you don't, you have a certain foundation for who you are and how you work. And if your foundation doesn't fit the company, then you as a leader, it's, you could be wasting your time on someone or if they're not a good culture fit. So like values definitely matter a lot with recruitment. Absolutely. So let's go a little deeper. Core values, I'm gonna say this again, core values anchor and guide daring leadership. Core values anchor and guide daring leadership. When you are clear about your values, 
it becomes your North Star. So on those days when leadership is a challenge, on those days when you're feeling super vulnerable, on those days when your mindset is maybe not where it should be, you connect back with your core values and know that that's what will support you. Because then you know what is important to you and how to show up. So for instance, one of my core values is freedom. So on a day when I feel like giving up, I have to remind myself that what I'm doing is going to and continues to allow me to express myself and have freedom from a lot of other things that I would not really want to do. So when I get frustrated, when I feel like I'm overwhelmed, when, I, when that vulnerability starts to become, in my mind, something negative instead of something positive, I have to connect back to my core values and know that what I'm doing really supports that. And that this vulnerable feeling is a tool to help me grow somehow. It makes sense now when you're not in that moment, but sometimes that's hard, right? So either this is the most boring topic I've ever presented to you, or you're really thinking. So tell me, which is it? <laughs> and I was thinking about this, right? And you know, I think we all have that moment when we're faced with a situation, something comes up and you get that uncomfortable feeling in the pit of your stomach and you don't know if it's because you don't know maybe sometimes you don't know what it is but it's really important that we listen to that inner monologue and that inner voice and and understanding why you know things happen the way that they do and if you don't it's gonna you know, if you don't deal with it it's gonna deal with you so you have to be in tune with that i think and that's sort of what you know, when it goes against your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true, Liz. Thank you. All right. So let me share another lesson with you from Brene's book. The other lesson is around feedback. We talked about that briefly, right? So she says, courageous leaders give and solicit. They give and solicit, which means you are comfortable asking for the feedback. Uh, it's honest feedback, right? And, and look, we know sometimes the truth hurts. Am I right? Sometimes the truth hurts. But, you know, if we know that whoever is providing us the feedback is doing it to help us become better, to improve the situations around us, that's really what we have to see in the feedback. And so if you're the one providing the feedback, that's the mindset to get into, right? Is, okay, I want to share some feedback with this person, not because I want to make them feel bad or criticize them, because it's an opportunity to help them see something they clearly can't see themselves. Or it could be that they see it, but they're not, they're not acting on it, right? So that, that is an important part of leadership. Now, who's ever been in a situation where they've had to give or receive feedback? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone, right? So talk to me about the process of, of giving feedback. And if this is something that is either challenging you or something you think you've really, you know, developed some mastery around. Um, my biggest thing when giving feedback is just to be honest. It has to be honest and it has to be clear. It has to be clear because sometimes with, with that process of giving feedback, it's like this long dissertation. Just, just get to the point. Here's, here's what I'm observing and here's what I need you to know, right? The other part of feedback is asking the other person to share what they're thinking and feeling, right? So feedback is a conversation. Feedback is a conversation. So it has to be honest, it has to be clear. Uh, I would say perspective is really big too. Say again. Kind of perspective. Okay. In some tell situation. Us more. Uh, I guess like depending on the situation or if what's I guess it just, it's a situational kind of thing, but I I, I don't know how to describe it. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's all right. It's okay. Yeah, perspective though. I, I, it, perspective is how you see something, right? 
Yeah. So you're coming at it from your perspective. The other person is going to come from it at, at their own perspective, right? And so that's why I say it has to be a two-way street. Like you have to, so if you're providing feedback, you have to be willing to hear and listen to what the other person is thinking and feeling too. And is that vulnerable well, when, when well, you I'm are willing? Yeah, go ahead, Emmy. Sorry, I'll give you an example. Um, this has actually happened to me, you know, when you're talking to a seller about listing their home and you have to tell them, you know, like your carpets don't smell that good or, you know, like when you have to give them feedback on what will make their listing even better. Like that's the worst situation and a good situation because you want to help them, but you almost have to approach it lightly. You know, you don't want to offend them, but at the same time, you want to gain the listing. So it's almost like, you know, when, when you're in that, that situation that you're giving them criticism or feedback, you know, you almost have to tweak what you're saying. So, you know, that's uh, that's another example of, of, you know, giving criticism, but having to do it in a positive manner. You know, you always want to know what they're feeling. They're going to, how they're going to feel at the end of, you know, your, your, your presentation. Yeah, very true. Very true. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm sure right now this market is, is giving you lots of opportunity to get good at feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Lisa, you want to say something? Yes. Uh, don't give us. Uh, don't give ex assumptions. Um, ah, yeah. And, Tell us uh, more. And give recommendations on how to improve if it's a negative. Uh, if it's negative. Yeah, I love that. So a big part of our culture here at Keller Williams, right? Part of our Y four C two Ts is to seek first to understand, mm -hmm. right? So even in your observations, realize that there could be more going on that you're not aware of, that you just aren't seeing. So it's important to you know, provide the feedback, but then ask questions like, were you aware of that? Is this something that you've seen before? What are you doing about it? You know, what, how do you feel about what I just said? And that gives that other person the opportunity to open up and share with you. But yeah, don't make assumptions. I think it comes back to the trust again, like we were talking about was if I'm going to give you feedback, I need you to trust me that I'm going to be, you know, that it's not going to turn into a big negative criticizing moment. Trust, it's back to trust again. Trust is such an important part of leadership because whoever you're leading, if they don't trust you, you're not really an effective leader, right? And, and so John Maxwell talks about this in the five levels of leadership. And I think that, you know, trust is an important multifaceted part of our work environment, right? And that we dance around that too sometimes, you know, and how, so how do you get to that point of being in a, in a trusted relationship where both parties feel trusted, you know, and Lisa was so brave to say, I think I'm pretty trustworthy, but I don't know if I trust everyone else. And, and honestly, uh, Brene talks about that in the book, that most people will say what you said, Lisa, that I'm a very trustworthy person. And I think people see that about me, but I have a hard time trusting others. That, that is a common feeling. Uh, and I don't know if anyone else in this group can relate to that and feels the same way Lisa does. So how do we build trust? And for some of us, you know, you might have to build trust with someone, like let's say an agent with a client, you're maybe only going to work with the, I mean, I know it feels like you work with them for a long time, but really, I mean, in the scheme of things, you're only working with them for a couple of months out of your life, right? But in the short window of time, you've got to build trust. And with coworkers, there has to be trust. And with, you know, people that, you know, I, I, we don't, Rosemary and I both hate the term boss. Don't ever call me your boss. I just want you to know that right now. <laughs> I just like, just like, you know, you work with me, but you don't, you know, you're, I'm not your boss. And uh, so even if there is someone on the leadership team that you're accountable to, right, or you report to, you know, how do you build trust with each other? So I, I'm going to ask a vulnerable question and put somebody on the spot. Um, Aaron, I've worked with you the longest, and I think you and I have great trust in each other. How did we form that trust together? I don't even know if we've ever talked about it out loud. 
Well, I think it's consistency. I think once you start to have regular conversations and you start to be in each other's orbit long enough and it's a consistent response from someone, you build trust. If it's every time I talk to somebody, I get a different person or a different response or a different attitude that you, you can't trust somebody. You can't have that comfort. So I think it's a lot of consistency. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the other thing that built trust for us is that I know I can have a tough conversation with you. I can have what we call fierce conversation. That's another good book. Um, Either way, right? And that we still trust, we still respect each other. We still have each other's backs. There's, there's, it's not personal. Mm-hmm. You have to know where it's coming from. Exactly. You have to know that if, if you believe that it's coming from a place of, of care and growth and helping you better yourself, then you trust it. If you feel like it's coming from a punitive direction, then I think that's where they're, they're, the trust gets lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think also that, that we both want what's best for each other and the company and the people in it. So sometimes, right, we have to have those honest conversations because there's a bigger, there's something bigger at stake than someone's feelings, right? And that, that's the other part of leadership not a lot of us want to talk about. But, you know, it's, leadership is not about being popular all the time. Leadership sometimes is making tough decisions or asking of people of things that, you know, they don't necessarily want to do or that they get uncomfortable about. It's, it's not to make anyone feel bad. It's because it's part of a bigger picture. And, and as leaders, we take that responsibility that it's more than just one person's feelings. Not that for the sake of the company, if your feelings get hurt, it's okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it's usually not personal. It's because there's, there's something bigger that we all have to be part of. Um, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. So if you want to take this conversation to a little bit higher level for your own, you know, development for your own growth, I can give you a little bit of like a journal prompt, you know, ask yourself, what does trust really mean to me? Because that's different for all of us. And I think a great question that we should ask each other more often, it's part of our interview process, but it doesn't seem to ever get asked again. So I'm going to ask it now. Maybe it's two questions. Number one, how do I win with you? And how do I lose with you? Can you answer those questions about everybody uh, on your team? Right. And your team is, you know, the staff, the ALC members, right? Like, how, do you know that about me? Do you know how you win with me? And do you know how you lose with me? Do I know that about you? See, that's what builds trust, right? Is, is, is that's one part of it, right? So, so what else is important to you? in terms of trust. Does anybody have anything they want to share? Um, I think you hit on it a little bit. Um, It's respect and it's gotta be mutual respect. Um, You know, we're living in a time where between the vaccine and and, uh, the government and what's going on, like I, I see so many people just not respecting others just on what your beliefs are. And so um, I would really have a hard time receiving from somebody that didn't respect who I am and and what I do. So you, it has to be mutual respect. And also um, if there's any kind of patronizing or kind of, you know, anything condescending, I I shut down, I I don't receive. So I try not to do those things as a leader. Mm -hmm. Well said. So um, Brene refers to this acronym in the book And if you're, you know, we're all used to acronyms at Keller Williams. (laughs) So here's the acronym when she talks about trust. It's braving, braving. The B is for boundaries. When building trust, there has to be boundaries. You have to know how far you can go in any conversation with anyone. And everyone's boundaries are different. That's why you ask, how do I win? How do I lose with you? Right? So boundaries. And if you're not sure of the boundaries, you have to just ask. You have to establish boundaries. And, and so the, the most um, healthy relationships have done that. You might not know you've done it, but somehow you've established the boundaries. The R is reliability. And I think Aaron touched on that, right? The consistency, reliability, that the person that you're talking to shows up the same way. They do what they say they're going to do. Um, and, and probably part of that is that they're aware of their own limitations. The A is accountability. That's another part of trust. 
right? And so here's the thing about accountability. It's not just being accountable to someone else. A another way to define accountability is that you take ownership for your own actions and that you realize that if you're not on goal, it's on you, right? It's, it's, it's based on something you're doing or not doing. Now there's opportunity to fix it, get back on track, ask for help, of course, but, but it starts with saying, you know what? I, I take responsibility for this. It's not somebody else's fault. You know, the people who are always blaming it on someone else or something else, that's, that's a victim. That's a victim. That's how we define victim, right? So it's, it's taking ownership and, and that's someone who is empowered and, and really thriving. The V in braving is vault, which um, it, it, she refers to vault as if I share something with you, is it locked in the vault? Or am I gonna find out you talked about it over coffee with someone else? And I'm gonna tell you something, even those of us who think that we are putting integrity before all things are all guilty of doing this. And we, we've all done it. And we all sometimes start with like, I'm not trying to say anything about that person, but I just want you to know what they told me. Really? Right. So we have to be honest about that. Like if someone's going to come to you and share something in confidence, does it stay there? Are you a vault? Because if they can't trust you. And here's the interesting thing about this. I just want to say this, too. So let's say Aaron shares something with me in confidence and then I wind up calling Karen Sacconi and tell her all about it. Maybe Aaron's never going to know I said it. So Aaron's trust isn't broken. But what do you think Karen might think once in a while? Karen's going to sit back and go, note to self, don't tell her anything because she's going to tell somebody else. So it's really, um, it's about having that, that trust be built on knowing that you can be trusted. The I is integrity, right? Choosing to do what's right instead of doing what's comfortable. That's what integrity really is. The N is non-judgment. So this is all something to strive for for all of us because we're all human and we all struggle with something here on this list at some point, right? So staying out of judgment. G is generosity, being consistently generous in your words and your actions and your gratitude. That's what she refers to as um, braving, which is how to build trust. So we packed a lot into this conversation. This was just trying to give you uh, some of the, I think the biggest nuggets from, from her book, Daring to Lead, really a very good book. Um, and I think, you know, another key thing that we touched on briefly here is that failure. And um, not that we intend to fail or set out to fail, but knowing that when it happens, it is part of a learning process and it's part of our courage and bravery and that we have to get comfortable with that vulnerability too. And the other thing she talks about, and I talk about this a lot, is um, the, the toxic nature of perfectionism. And, you know, I am still working on that with myself. This is one of my uh, character flaws is this, this quest for perfectionism. Uh, so I'll be vulnerable on that one. And um, it's, constantly re reminding ourselves that it's progress. As long as the progress is in the right direction at the right speed, it's progress over perfectionism because perfectionism can hold us back from being vulnerable, right? And perfectionist, perfectionism can hold us back from that being really courageous and daring to lead. So uh, she talks about that in the book too. So um, just help me understand if this was something that you found valuable. Tell me your ahas. I'd like to hear from a lot of you. We still have about eight minutes, so there's plenty of time to share. Is there anything in this conversation that you thought was really important to you and, and that you needed to hear today? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I, it was something Lee said, actually. It was, you know, it, you think of accountability, but you also have to be accountable to the people that are accountable to you. Because if somebody's looking to me for accountability and I'm not hitting my goals, what example is that setting? To them to hit theirs. True. Very true. I'm uh, gonna pick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen. You're good. 
Uh, I would say that the most one of the recent things you said is how do I win with you and how do I lose with you? There's just something about that that I really like. I think that applies to almost any situation in your life. And for some reason, for what I'm personally going through in my life, this just really hit me. So that helped me in some spiritual way. <laughs> okay, awesome. Is that a question you're going to ask more of? Yeah, for sure. I think it's an important question to ask. So Perfect. Who else? I was going to say that, you know, I look at other people and I feel like nobody else is vulnerable, but now I know we all are, you know, you think everyone else has it together and nothing flaps their wings, but it does. So that's good to hear. Be sure to check my YouTube channel for a Monday morning mojo titled, I'm a hot mess and so are you. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right up my alley. <laughs> yep, I did. That's exactly what we talked about one Monday. We're all, we're all a little bit of a hot mess in there. And uh, our, so the goal is not to just say, I'm a hot mess and love me anyway, right? We're always going to try to, you know, work our way through things. But at the end of the day, it's that that being comfortable, being vulnerable enough to say, I don't have it all together. I'm still trying to figure it out. No, it's good to know other people feel the same so that's good yeah margaret, margaret you here Hi. yeah you know i sent out a property needs letter for a client i'm working with um to a couple of different places over the last few days and i get a call last night at one o'clock in the morning from someone who received the letter and they intentionally called me at that time because they were irritated by receiving the letter so they called me to irritate me and I thought, to, and in my vulnerable moment at one o'clock in the morning, morning, waking up out of a sleep, I thought I was ready to reach through the phone and choke them by their neck. And I thought to myself, I'm like, you know what? I don't know where this person is coming from. Who knows what their situation is? Let it go and send out the next 50 tomorrow morning. And that's exactly what I did. Thank you for sharing. I have to say that that is an exceptional example of, um, a, a positive mindset. So good for you. Because <laughs> somebody called me at that hour. And I, that was that was being pretty uh pretty mean. But thank you for sharing. Heather, did you want to say anything? Um, yeah, so I just love that this conversation um, really reiterated that feedback is a conversation. Um, so many times when you hear the word feedback, you get that sense of dread, whether you are the giver or the receiver. And I think it's important to recognize that it shouldn't be like that. And it should be a conversation. And it should be about where are we right now? How are we going to move forward? Um, so I, I really enjoyed circling back um, to that philosophy because I think I think our our thoughts kind of go wild sometimes with the word feedback. Yeah, and sometimes we have to remember if we're the one providing the feedback that it's not a monologue, right? Right. That we want to get their input and engage their feelings too. Yeah. Thank you. Hundred percent. Anna. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to mention that feedback doesn't always have to be negative. Right. Thank you. Okay. A lot of times people need to hear your positive feedback. Yes, they need you know? to hear you're doing a good job or I appreciate you or I, I recognize what you're working on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why we try, you know, and I, even though sometimes we get an eye roll or two, we try to ask for like those, those moments where you fill someone's bucket or share something good happening or gratitude, right? Because we want to exercise that as much as anything else. Some more, I need some more feedback, guys. What else? What did you take away from our conversation today? Um, I was going to say that just because it, it's nice knowing like everybody else's level of vulnerability. I can't talk today, so I'm sorry. Because just what I necessarily might perceive me as what I find vulnerable, others might not, and everyone's comfort level is different. So yeah. just to recognize and understand that. Beautiful. Thank you, Jenna. I think this encourages me to look at the places where I'm avoiding vulnerability because in there is where my opportunity is going to lie for growth. Yeah. And that is what's going to make me an effective leader. So all this time I'm avoiding this vulnerability, right? Perfectionism, all of that, but I'll be most effective when I find that. Yes. Excellent. I think I definitely agree with what Amanda just said too. Um, 
and I just thought this whole conversation was really interesting as well. And I think it's important to come together as leaders and, and discuss this kind of thing. Like what Jenna said, it's everyone is at a different um, comfort level with their amount of vulnerability. So um, being able to just talk about it together helps us all grow as leaders. So I definitely think that this conversation was just really interesting and important to have. And also, I'm Emmy, by the way, I haven't met a lot of you, but <laughs> I'm from um, upstate, so nice to meet you all. Yes, that's Emmy. All right, and we have time for one more. Be vulnerable, be courageous. So, and I think piggybacking on what Emmy just said, I do, I think that having this conversation helps us all recognize the fact that feedback is coming from, or at least in this environment and context, feedback is coming from a good place and not a bad place and that it's meant as a, as a growth tool and not as something to demean you or to make you feel bad about yourself, but to actually help you become better at whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'll say this in closing, right? So we talked about what makes a good experience around feedback. So that all being true. If, if, if someone wasn't pointing out to you a way that you could do something better, they're really being a disservice to you, right? So if I have to worry that I can't be honest enough with someone on this team and provide you with feedback that's gonna help you get to the next level because I, I'm afraid to be vulnerable or I'm afraid that you can't handle the vulnerability, right? Then we're not in a healthy relationship, right? So that, that's dysfunctional, really. So I think that you know, having these conversations, it's about mutual respect. It's about knowing that we're all working together to make great things happen. And so if we have feedback that is truly valuable, not sharing it is really a disservice. Right. And so um, I think it goes back to what are we doing to get to know each other more? What are we doing to build trust? Um, you know, are we asking those questions? How do I win with you? How do I lose with you? You know, knowing that ahead of time and knowing that when one of us comes to the other and says, so I have some feedback for you. Is it okay that I share it with you? Then that conversation can happen in a way that's just going to have everyone grow. Right. So thank you so much for being a part of this today. I hope you found value in it. And again, I'm looking forward to chatting with any of you one on one if you have other thoughts or questions. And again, the book is Daring to Lead, Daring to Lead by Brene Brown. So um, you might want to add that to your growth plan. So thanks so much for all of your participation, too. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Anna. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Anna. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye now. Yo, I have nips in my bag.